to thank you everybody for joining us here for kind of our first ever video uh, fireside Q&A. Uh, I want to thank both Synthetics, uh, Chainlink, and the blockchain community for joining us today. Uh, in addition, I wanted to thank Justin Moses, the CTO of Synthetics, and Johan Eid, the product manager of Chainlink, for also being kind of our panelists here during this Q&A session. Uh, the overall goal of this Q&A is really to allow the community to learn more about the integration between Synthetics and Chainlink, exploring what makes integration unique and beneficial to both the teams and the users of each product. So just to briefly go over the agenda for the first 30 to 40 minutes, we're going to have kind of a fireside chat structure that will then be followed by about 10 to 15 minutes of questions that we have gathered from both the Synthetics and the Chainlink community in the past few days. If for some reason you have a question that was not addressed, please feel free to drop by the Synthetics Discord or various Chainlink channels after the chat, and we will do our best to answer them. We will also add any links to the description of the YouTube uh, once completed so you can follow up with your research and explore further. Uh, so without further ado, um, Justin, if you wouldn't mind kind of introducing yourself, maybe explaining a little bit about your background and then uh, talking about what your team is, is building or has already built with Synthetics. Cool, awesome, thanks Rory. And thanks uh, for uh, Chainlink and uh, the community for setting this up, appreciate it. So yeah, I'm Justin, uh, I'm the CTO of Synthetics and uh, I'm actually originally from Australia and I happen to be in Australia right now, um, but I'm actually typically based in New York and I have been there for uh, almost the past decade actually. Uh, my background is in, in, in traditional uh, web engineering, full stack engineering. Um, I actually came the founder of, of Synthetics and I've been friends since high school and we actually had a startup together about, uh, oof, yeah, about 10 years ago, just before I moved to New York. And uh, he was the one who actually very much convinced me to sort of go out of just traditional web 2.0 and come back into, come up with uh, web 3.0. So it's been a fun little journey, sort of porting my knowledge into the crypto space this past uh, couple of years. Awesome. Uh, what about what about Synthetics? Can you give us kind of just a brief idea, maybe for those that aren't sort of aware of what you guys have built? Yeah, so Synthetics is a synthetic asset platform um, on Ethereum. We were originally called Haven when we were um, simply a stablecoin project, uh, but then we pivoted about around about December last year um, into a synthetic assets as we sort of saw the, the, the writing on the wall uh, where the stablecoin industry was at very um, you know, regulated stable coins that we originally didn't think were going to be a thing became a thing with things like you know, Gemini and Paxos. Um, and at the same time, we sort of realized we had this, this ability to, um, to denominate a sort of a, 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 a group, a sort of a collaborative debt pool, if you will, denominated in different types of um, assets. And so we started doing it with, with um, foreign currencies. So we started with like JPY, GPP and gold and silver. Um, and then we introduced uh, synthetic Bitcoin earlier in the year, and that's and really started to see a lot of uh, interest. And then from there, we started adding other uh, crypto assets. And basically, I think a big part of it, well, one, our success has been because we have really well placed as DeFi has been accelerating. Uh, but two, we, there is, you know, let's be honest, there's a lot of capital in Ethereum, and um, uh, it can be very easily allocated to, you know, the, the synthetic prices of a lot of things. And um, synthetics enables that very easily due to the fact that. Um, the whole system's um, uh, incentivized by everyone who stakes in our system. So the people who, who hold SNX, they stake in the system. Um, they basically have a, a, a debt position. Um, and for that, they get rewarded. And that uh, debt position can then be traded into other synths. So enabling people to basically um, get access to synthetic assets and uh, even inverses, which is our kind of solution for shorts. Um, in a way that you can't really do otherwise in Ethereum. Awesome, thank you very much for that. Uh, Johan, how about yourself? Yeah, hey, Rory, thank you. Uh, uh, so, yeah, I mean, I got into crypto a few years ago. Um, so first I got into the interoperability space. I think what's very interesting with interoperability is really currently the uh, blockchain ecosystem is extremely siloed, right? Uh, we are siloed between blockchains, but mostly between blockchains and the real world. Uh, so seeing and working through how we can make the blockchain more connected, more connected to real world use cases, more connected to interoperable between different platforms uh, was always something interesting for me. So I joined Chainlink about eight months ago. Uh, my main job has been really to work on integration. So working with very smart people like uh, Justin here and other DeFi teams and DeFi projects or basically crypto projects to see how Chainlink can help them. 
to work on oracles and basically this kind of part of the stack, which maybe they don't want to focus on that much because they have so much other work to do, right? They have so much other stuff to work on, uh, being able to see how Chainlink can take this worry from them and can help them scale and can help them create a framework which is secure to get data from the real world into their dApps. So that's been the stuff I've been mostly focusing on uh, over at Chainlink. Um, now, as far as uh, defining Chainlink, I mean, Chainlink for me is really a framework to get connected smart contracts and basically leverage the full power of smart contracts, right? So uh, smart contracts have very really nice properties, properties such as determinism, whenever they should execute, they execute, and that's cutting basically uh, the middleman, which basically has been at the center of every transaction. So um, currently, if you want to enter into a contract in the real world between one person and another, you need a third party, right? Uh, smart contracts allow to cut this third party and to have very strong security guarantees on the execution of a given contract. Uh, now, the issue with these smart contracts is that they need real world data to get any kind of uh, interesting use cases, right? They need pricing data. Uh, so, the FX and commodity prices we've set up for uh, synthetics, for instance, uh, they need any kind of data basically to get interesting use cases like derivatives, contract, insurance products, all of this stuff. And there are many ways to get this data. Uh, there is a safe way, which is basically leveraging the lessons of uh, blockchains we already have. Decentralization is key. Uh, having multiple nodes across the world which are incentivized to run and to get consensus. Um, in, the, in the case of blockchain, it's consensus on the state of the network. In this case of Chainlink, it's consensus of the state of the data. What is the source of truth, basically? Um, so yeah, basically kind of our goal that Chainlink is the same way a developer right now, if he wants to create a DAP, will use Ethereum by default uh, because they don't have to create their own blockchain this way, right? It's not their main use case. Um, well, we would like developers who want data onto their smart contract application to use Chainlink by default because their main use case is not to build oracles, it's to maybe recreate finance, recreate the insurance world, and that's already a lot of work. So being able to have a platform that you can trust and that you can leverage is extremely important in my opinion. So that's kind of our mission at Chainlink, offering developers and companies the ability to use uh, oracles and to access data in a safe way without having to pour 50% of their resources into it and without risking any kind of uh, yeah failures there. So that's, yeah. That's it. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for that detailed description. Uh, that being said, we'll kind of go into some of the, the Q&A part here and we'll start with uh, with Justin with these and then Johan, you can chime in. Some of these it may make sense for both of you to speak and some sometimes it may just make sense for one. Uh, and so we'll kind of take take the uh, conversation there. So that being said, we'll start with you, Justin. Why did it make sense for you to pursue this integration with Chainlink in this case? Well, I mean, we've been, uh, I mean, I think many people have sort of heard about our Oracle incident that happened in, uh, I think, late June of this year. Um, you know, it was obviously very, quite a famous thing. And a lot of people have, have attached it to the narrative of, you know, this is the, the problem with running a centralized Oracle. And I think, I mean, I think for us, the thing that's always been, you know, always been the goal of the entire team is to, is to move to the most decentralization. We just don't, you know, we aren't the kind of, um, it's not really the fabric or the ethos of the team to sort of, you know, accept the current status quo. And, you know, the idea of trusting companies or trusting, you know, us as core team, is just not something that we think is a viable, you know, a long-term solution. And, you know, we, it made sense for us to have a centralized Oracle in the, in the first place. I think, you know, both Ken and I do have, um, and the rest of the team have a lot of startup, ex startup experience. And so for us to be able to move ahead and bootstrap from the, from day one was really important. So it made sense to be centralized, but, um, you know, the writing has been on the wall for a long time, even well before the uh, Oracle outage that we needed something decentralized. Our community has been talking about it for a long time. And um, it was even, uh, I'm trying to think of when we did the first, I think it was even almost a year ago when we first basically did some, did our first R&D into Chainlink and sort of looked at and looked at that because it was a bit clear sort of front runners in the space, excuse the pun. Um, but uh you know, when we uh, when we looked again after the Oracle outage, a lot of a lot of teams had come to us and said, you know, hey, here we heard we heard you had a problem with Oracles, and we really did our due diligence and looked around, and 
Um, and we said, well, you know, Chainlink is definitely the most uh, the most established. And you know, every time we dealt with them, we just uh, the level of expertise was kind of incredible. So I feel like we're in good hands. Awesome. Thank you very much. I don't think most people realize the length of time. Sometimes these integrations uh, can take sometimes over a year mm -hmm. to actually make something happen together. Uh, Johan, uh, that being said, why did it make sense, you know, for you to work with synthetics? Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, yeah, when, when I was talking about Chainlink, I was really saying that our role in this ecosystem, I see it as being a tool provider for teams to kind of build out their vision and having a platform to rely on which will provide data, which will provide it securely in a decentralized manner. Uh, so yeah, basically synthetics is building out something which is really important for the ecosystem, in my opinion. Um, they've been getting more and more traction because they're really showing what you can do on blockchain as far as finance goes. And I think they keep pushing the boundaries. So being able for us to support this kind of project is really important. Uh, in the end, the success of kind of um, of ecosystems like the DeFi ecosystem, like the insurance ecosystem, all of these on blockchain, uh, our success depends on their success. You know, if you are able to help them succeed in their vision, then basically we'll have a thriving ecosystem where basically the network will keep running and where node operators will be able to get incentivized by providing data to these key players. So yeah, I really think um, uh, synthetics is a perfect case for chaining and it, yeah, it's been a thrill working with them. So uh, basically it's made a lot of sense for us to, to support them and to work with them. And yeah. Awesome, thank you very much. Uh, moving on to the next one, Justin, what do you think the actual value is? You touched a little bit on this, but what's the actual value in using a decentralized Oracle versus like a centralized Oracle controlled by a single party? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think trust is really the big thing. I mean, basically, I mean, you know, the, but basically you would imagine that anyone or sort of a number of people in the core team of, you know, synthetics could basically, um, you know, be corrupted, be bribed or any such, any reason to um, change, you know, what comes out of the Oracle. Um, you know, moving over to Chainlink basically prevents that to the point where we just, we can't, you know, there's no way that anyone in the team or, or even anyone in Chainlink can just magically change prices. So it's, it's really just that uh, that concept that people can rely on the fact that, well, I can actually see that people have crypto economic, these providers of prices have crypto economic incentives to not cheat, right? Whereas right now there is, there, they don't exist. Well, I mean, for the, for the centralized Oracle we have, they still don't really exist, except for perhaps you could say that there's, you know, reputational risk and, and, and these things, but that's obviously, as we all learned, it's not sufficient in crypto um, to keep people's, you know, um, faith um, in, a, in a decentralized platform alive. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Johan, I don't know if you wanted to, to add anything to that, but maybe perhaps with uh, the various teams that you speak with, is it kind of similar feedback that you've received um, as what kind of Justin just spoke upon? Yeah, it's extremely similar feedback. I think it will always be very um, you know, similar to what Justin just said. I don't have much to add to this. I think also like um, Basically, building an, op an oracle, operating it, monitoring it is a lot of work, as Justin <laughs> knows already. So uh, being able to rely on operators whose whole job is to run blockchain infrastructure and who are DevOps security experts, because Chainlink is not the one running the nodes. Huh? It's uh, third parties, basically, who have multiple years of experience and who are running these nodes and who have a pager duty alert at night, if, if it be, if their node goes down and who are able to work in very stressful situation to basically counter any attacks or basically make sure that the node is always running. So that's a full-time job, being able to monitor nodes and having a network of decentralized right. oracles like this, who are able to keep track of the security of these nodes is extremely important in my opinion and makes a lot of sense in the current state of the ecosystem where people might not have the time with everything that's moving so fast to have another full-time job, which is monitoring an oracle. <laughs> so, Great, thank you so yeah, much, Johan. Actually, I was actually uh, uh, on vacation when we had our famous Oracle outage, and I just was <laughs> scrambling to get 3G at the time. It was uh, very unpleasant. So yeah, monitoring uh, Oracles and having a sort of a small team doing that. I mean, it's handy if you distribute around the world, but only have a small team for a whole set of Oracle pricing is is very very stressful. If you, you know, Mariano from um, from Make has talked about this a bit because he's been head of Oracles and he's talked about the sort of stress that he had he used to have on his end, and it's yeah, it's not. 
it's not pleasant to have it only rest on a, on a few people. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I guess that building on that as well, uh, there's obviously a certain number of kind of price feeds that these uh, decentralized oracles are, are feeding into. Is there an opportunity for that to expand? Is that the way it's going to be for a while, Justin? How do you kind of see that sort of developing over time? Yeah, well, I mean, we're, we just went through phase one, uh, which was just Forex and commodities. So that was our seven, uh, well, sorry, five Forex prices and our um, two commodities. And actually our fees right now are, are currently denominated in um, in the Forex. Uh, so we have a sort of, our fees are domin denominated in this thing called XDRs, which are, you know, synthetic drawing rights, a little bit similar to um, the idea of, you know, this, this sort of general finance of, of, of drawing rights. And it's a basket of these currencies. So definitely uh, moving to even the phase one of Forex, even though it might from the outside seem like somewhat uh, minimal um, due, due to the fact that those are much more, uh, are much less volatile assets. Uh, the truth is, it really is actually quite, quite key to our system that those uh, prices are valuable. Um, so for us, that phase one was obviously very important, but we're definitely on, on track to get to phase two, which is pretty much uh, the remainder of the crypto prices. Because I mean, all the crypto prices. So if you get if you get ETH, for example, you'd also have to do uh, inverse ETH, right? Because on our our current inverses, um, it's a pretty simple calculation. But right now, it's done on chain, so we just have to basically we basically pull from so from from ETH, we'll pull from pull from the uh, the chain link ETH aggregator. And that would both supply, obviously, the price for the, the short and the long. Um, so, yeah, we're definitely on track to continue the integration. Um, the only other thing, I think, the only other slight complexity is getting the indices working. So we recently, uh, well, recently, I guess back in uh, around Berlin Blockchain Week, we announced the, the SEX token, the um, SCX, the Centralized Exchange Token, which is an index of, you know, things like Wabi's token, Binance, uh, KuCoin. Um, and basically, that's a basket of, a number of different units of these. And so when we created them, the balance was such that so many KuCoin and so many of Huabi tokens altogether was about a thousand US dollars. Um, but obviously over time that's shifted. And so calculating these prices is something that that the um, the chain link nodes are going to do using our sort of using our um, using our code that says this is what the weightings are. Um, and then they're going to be calculated um, off chain and then pushed on chain. And that's something obviously that's going to take a bit of coordination. So it's probably like the last remaining piece, but we're definitely on track to, um, to, to, to decentralize everything. And I tell you from, from our end, it would definitely will be feel better for everyone speaking to, to be completely um, decentralized and remove that centralization risk of our Oracle. All right. Uh Johan, I guess that kind of goes to you. Obviously, there's a set number of, of feeds that currently exist. The ones created for synthetics, there's BTC USD, which was recently done, as well as ETH USD. Do you see that kind of continuing to grow over time as well for Chainlink? Yeah, I mean, sure. As far as the feeds, I'm not the one to answer because that's really on the user. The user can use Chainlink to get anything he wants, right? So whatever synthetics needs, they can use Chainlink to get it, and whatever the other DAP, uh, DAPs needs they can use chaining. So as we grow, we get more feeds. And as we talk to more projects, which, you know, uh, is, is happening, we'll get more feeds. So yeah, as we expand the ecosystem, the feeds will come with it because DeFi projects actually need a lot of different prices. Uh, synthetics needs a whole bunch and we have other use cases where people need a whole bunch of prices. So that's going to expand that. Okay, Johan, uh, I'll kind of keep it here with you. I know uh, architecturally, I believe they're using you're using something called you know a flux monitor, which basically monitors the price, and then there's a trigger. Can you explain a little bit, kind of maybe architecturally, sort of how something like that works? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's very simple. It's basically a piece of software which monitors the off-chain price of an asset. Basically, it will compare the on-chain price and the off-chain price, right? And whenever it sees a one percent deviation in the price, so 1% change, it will send a request to update the on-chain price because it will track the volatility there. Um, that's, that's a really important piece of technology because you don't want to update the price on a circular basis, right? Uh, maybe sometimes whenever you want to keep the price updated on let's say one hour a heartbeat like we have with FX and commodity just because you need to refresh these prices from time to time because they're not super volatile. Uh, but for prices which move a lot, being able to update whenever there is a 1% deviation or any kind of deviation is super important. Yeah. Great. Justin, why does that, uh, I think, I know in our community, I'd seen a lot of people kind of say, okay, 
maybe 1% deviation. That seems like a lot. Why does that solution work for synthetics in this case? Well, I think, I mean, one of the challenges with something like synthetics has been that many people are anchored into thinking about oracles for traditional order book, right? traditional DEXs. And they, they're like, oh, you know, um, a traditional DEX, the user will ask what the price is and they'll wait till they get a price and then later on they'll, they'll, they'll transact. But for us, every synth, every synthetic asset we have uh, represents part of the debt pool, right? So if let's say that all of the debt pool was denominated in US dollars, then, you know, okay, that, that's obviously not going to change because that one cent doesn't change. Everything's, you know, that's set to, to a dollar. But if everything's denominated in, in ETH and ETH price changes, then um, the debt pool's obviously grown, it's grown or shrunk depending. Um, so for us, it's not viable to be um, constantly requesting say, well, what is the price and then waiting? We need to know on chain atomically, what debt do we have outstanding? So that means we need, you know, instead of a pool model, we need a push model. So we actually need these, these prices in. And, and that's how our oracles always worked. Our centralized oracle has always been looking for time of update versus price deviation on chain versus off chain. Um, and so for us, obviously it's clearly important, right? Because anyone can move into uh, a price, you know, or to a synth, shall we say, um, as quickly as it takes for the block to be mined. Um, and so obviously that um, if our, if the price on chain is deviated significantly from the price off chain, then someone can, can make some profit there, some risk-free profit. Um, and so, you know, the 1% target is such that um, it basically tries to capture the fact that we have fees, which are currently at 50 bips, so 50 basis points, which is, you know, 0.5%. Um, and, uh, you know, we see that, uh, we see that 1% is like a reasonable compromise right now that, that, uh, you know, to, that our fees would capture that deviation, um, if it's over 1%, but there is still obviously a bit of a, a window there between 50 bips to hundred bips, but, you know, we can talk about that. The sort of solutions we have for that. Awesome. Staying kind of staying with you, Justin, I think what is, um, the next kind of hurdle, obviously, I, I know I've seen some sort of posts where you've talked about, okay, we're decentralizing the oracles, kind of what, what's the next step for kind of you and your team to sort of work towards that kind of decentralization goal uh, that you guys have set for yourselves? Well, definitely a DAO is the thing that, you know, Kane has been talking, our founder Kane's been talking about a fair bit. Um, it's definitely something that we're pushing very hard internally. We have just been talking about it, actually. We spent a long time talking about it uh, yesterday in the morning as a team. Um, this idea of really being able to take the entire, um, but right right now we have a foundation and obviously that actually turn it into a DAO and we're currently talking about having multiple DAOs for different parts, like one part for foundation or treasury or something, one part for um, the technical, one part for the community. And we're, we're, we think that that's, um, that will really take us to, um, I guess, the next place that we need to be as a team. Um, but also that part of that too is about uh, making sure that we have even more, uh, removing more trust. So right now we do have owner access over certain things uh, in our contracts. And that's definitely, again, something that the community trusts us with, but it's something that we know it's a bridge we need to cut. And as part of the DAOs, it's something that we're going to be cutting those bridges to the you know, um, for us, you know, just as a team to be able to change those change owner actions will be something that, the, that a group of people, you know, stakeholders will be able to actually do in the near future. All right, thank you very much. Uh, Johan, kind of getting one sort of individually for, for Chainlink, what's sort of the current focus of the team right now? And, and what is it sort of looking to kind of incrementally build um, sort of in the short to, short to near term? Yeah, I mean, I think currently the main stuff is really um, having more and more network growth, so being able to more and more sustain and help the ecosystem. Like, um, basically, I think we really have a vision of helping the ecosystem now today, right? So what makes sense today, what is being built today? I think DeFi is something which is super important, which really is working right now on Ethereum. So for, for two years, for people who've been in Ethereum for a while, we were kind of in this desert, right? Where not really a lot of stuff was happening. There were a lot of promises, but you know, not really a lot of projects were really building stuff for, which people could use, right? And today we kind of have this oasis, which is DeFi, which is really projects which are building stuff which could really revolutionize uh, the way we do uh, finance, right? And it's a really great use case for blockchain technology. So being able to support these projects as you are doing with synthetics um, is something that's super important for us. Um, as far as core features, we are working on a bunch of really cool stuff. Um, of course, um, there is stuff like staking, which is in the pipeline. There is stuff 
like um, threshold signatures, all of these uh, basically component core features will help secure a bit the more secure system with stronger crypto economy guarantees, for instance, for staking and threshold signature to make a more sustainable system where basically um, Ethereum, as a lot of people uh, know, is not super scalable right now. Threshold signatures will help tremendously by providing more decentralization because basically the cost of sending responses on chain will be much, much cheaper, right? But cheaper means more oracles. More oracles means more decentralization, which amounts to more security, which in the case of a DeFi ecosystem whose value keeps rising, 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 you probably want more security. So, so those are the main stuff we're working on. All right, thank you very much. Justin, kind of moving on to sort of a, a, a sort of a bigger question, working in the DeFi space right now, what do you think is kind of the next big hurdle uh, for the entire space to really take that next step? It's been very exponential, I think, over this past year. What is that next thing, in your opinion, that really has to happen for it to, to continue that sort of movement? Mm. Yeah, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Uh, yeah, it's interesting to try to sort of think like what, like I, we all map our narratives right onto what's happening and, and crypto is such a complex space that, that that's all we're gonna do, trying to find a narrative and latch onto it and maybe retrospectively be like, see, I was right. Um, and maybe it's a bit trite to say this, but I do feel like right now it's, you know, it's all Ethereum people kicking the tires, people who have Ether and then they're, they're moving around doing things with it. Uh, people are just seeing what's possible. Um, I do feel like we need to get outside of that at some point. Um, you know, people outside of the, the ether space. Is it, is it people like our friends and community? It's interesting to say, I mean, it's hard to know, do they have capital to deploy to try this out? You know, like I've talked to various people in my family and, um, and my friends and a lot of people do get it. And definitely people who anchored in traditional finance will get it, get kind of what we're doing and what the is happening more. Um, but this whole money Lego business, this whole idea of composability, this idea of writing code that takes one piece of finance and connects this to another. Like I've definitely seen a lot of people's eyes light up when they see that and then they kind of get it, even if they're not engineers, they get this sort of idea. So I'd like to bring in more people who are from maybe from the outside. And I think, um, I think the, for me as an engineer, I, I definitely learn best as a, when I tinker. And I think that I'd love to see more people start understanding how finance works by able to play with some of this, maybe play is not the right word, but to, you know, to, to, to tinker with some of the stuff with small scale so that they can actually learn and understand how these financial products work because there is a lot of, um, and there's a big gap, a big chasm there, I think, between for all of us, perhaps unless compared to like full traders, you know, like I, as I tinker more into um, into something, like if I go, you're playing the BitMEX, if you've never really worked with derivatives, it can be quite intimidating when you first look at it, be like, what's going on here? You know, and I think that a lot of people just don't have access to that. and. Um, slowly bringing in more people from the outside and actually getting them to sort of educating them on how finance works might sort of, sort of kick down the door perhaps of this sort of very established industry and make people realize they could um, talk um, intelligently about these topics to people who might have been trading for, for 20 years after and maybe only doing crypto for a year, which is pretty powerful because then all of a sudden this group of people who had this, this power, you know, to basically maneuver the financial market may slowly they realize that they're um, that other new people can actually start to understand what's going on in sort of a meaningful way that, you know, perhaps we've all seen the big short and we sort of get, okay, I get what mortgage backed securities are and how it works. But once you've been in sort of the space as a user, I think you can really viscerally understand it's much better, even though of course it's different. They're like credit default swaps or kind of insurance. These are very kind of complicated derivatives, but um, as I feel like we have the opportunity to sort of keep educating people in a meaningful way. And I think the next thing for DeFi I feel, and again, it's tried, is, is bringing in some of those people to sort of uh, more of our extended community so to sort of get this and okay, this is getting the stuff and I'm starting to see how this maps to what's happening in the real world. Um, yeah, what goes from there, you know, who knows? Awesome, great answer, yeah, thank you. I think it's, there's only so many people that even understand traditional finance and then you have the people that understand crypto and traditional finance and it's a small group of people, but I think, you know, given enough time, hopefully enough people will uh, spread the word that uh, we can start bringing in more and more people into this space. Pretty, pretty exciting stuff. And again, the rapid growth in DeFi, I think shows that at minimum, the crypto community is enjoying it. Um, interested to see what happens when it really expands to, to sort of the greater world there. Um, we're, what we're going to do now is we've kind of gone through this first section. We did have some community questions, so we're going to work to answer some of those now. 
uh, to the best of our ability. Again, if your question doesn't get asked, by all means, hop into uh, Synthetics as a Discord as well that they're very active in. We have multiple channels over at Chainlink, so hop in there. If you didn't get them answered, uh, we'll do our best to certainly answer them for you after this. So kind of the first one here. Uh, do you foresee that the scheduled heartbeats will suffice for the synthetic exchange needs? Will there ever be the potential for on-demand pools? So I guess, Justin, this one's a little bit more directed towards you. Yeah, I think right. So right now we have the, the heartbeats. We have, the heartbeats have been set up to an, an hour, and I think eventually they're going to slow down more. I mean, the hope is really that, or well, the trust is going to be on deviations, right? That they'll, that you just know, or the price, we know that the price is based on what we've seen. The oracles will update when they see a deviation of a certain amount. The heartbeats really are just that, right? Like just making sure like, hey, we're, we're alive. Our centralized oracle had obviously a lot more heartbeats because you know, it's just a lot cheaper and easier to do. We don't have a single uh, centralized oracle to do it. Uh, but over time, we, we have to adjust our system, basically handle uh, longer and longer uh, times between. And I think, uh, I think you know, from our perspective, it is a little nerve wracking, I think, to like relinquish a little bit of that, that control and relinquish that, okay, we have a centralized oracle that we know and, and rely on, but that's kind of part of this. So I think um, in the short term, as we have the one hour heartbeats, it's definitely not a problem. I think as we sort of transition to twice a day heartbeats, and I hope by that point that we uh, are actually um, confident that what's been happening, you know, it, it, the system is working. And I think, I guess that kind of is trust again, right? But it shouldn't have to be, but that's how we humans sort of work, right? We have to, we as a team, I guess, have to trust that this, this decentralized system is, is working. Um, even though everything's in place for it to work, it's still a little scary. You know, if anyone, if anyone's ever worked on, you know, production code and then had to change it when there's no test for it, it can be pretty scary because you're like, well, this thing's been working in production for how long? And now we're moving into something else that I have, <laughs> you haven't used in production. Um, and to answer your question about the pools, uh, I didn't think it's possible. It's not how, as I mentioned before about how our debt's denominated and stuff like that. It's problematic uh i think like we definitely our whole system's architect in a way that we need to know what the debt is at any moment um and that is you know if you let's say you did only a pool model then how would you know if any the system ever wanted to know what the current value of the debt pool is it would have to you know, it would have to go out and then you know wait asynchronously for a response to come back and say okay this is what all the prices is of everything um, but that being said we've iterated on many many different ideas in the past and we're even right now talking about um siloed collateral for for ETH as collateral so definitely there could be well an option to have this idea of like as a different part of our debt pool to have parts of that um, managed with a pool model and we're also looking at um, synthetic positions which is more of our kind of pie in the sky idea of like leverage trading on um on ethereum and that definitely for example could also be an area where we could do uh, a pool model for pricing so there's, there's options for it for sure uh, but right now we're just trying to move over to Decentralized oracles with chain link in a way that that is smooth and you know uh, error prone free that gets us back to gets us the power keeps us the parity I should say uh, before we look at like moving to uh, the pool based model. Okay, thank you very much. Very thorough answer. I appreciate that, uh, Johan. I guess this one's a little bit more for you, but can you talk at all about the actual uh, chain link nodes that are kind of providing the price feeds for this in integration? Is this something that can be seen or displayed anywhere? Um, for people to kind of see how the interaction is taking place. Yeah, of course, we've created visualizations and I mean, you can see everything on chain, right? Also, uh, who's running what and you can see the transactions. So all that is fully transparent. Um, as far, and I, I think we can drop the links for the visualizations after, right? Somewhere. Sure, yep. Um, as far as who's running these nodes, um, I mean, all the people running the nodes are basically blockchain infrastructure companies. So. Uh, you probably know about blockchains like Cosmos, like Tezos, which kind of sprung up this community of people we call uh, node operators. Node operators are basically people whose job is to operate full nodes and secure networks, right? So on Cosmos or Tezos, they stake, for instance, tokens, or I I'm talking about this platform. Those, those are just examples of very strong communities, node operator communities, where people basically operate infrastructure for a living. They get paid because they operate this infrastructure, right? They get paid through inflation on these networks. Um, on Chainlink, basically, we like most of the Chainlink node operators are basically these people, uh, blockchain infrastructure professionals who've been doing this for years, who have mostly a background in DevOps in security, 
And basically, who know how to handle uh, very high availability systems like the ones which are required here. So um, those are the people running Zeno the nodes. Um, and, I mean, it's kind of great in the way where, you know, in a centralized system, basically, you can have a super competent team running one node. In a decentralized system like ours, you can have like 20 super professional teams from all over the world monitoring their node, but also monitoring other people, right? If they see that someone is down on a reference contract, they can ping him, hey, you're down. <laughs> you see, like you have multiple people whose job is to monitor their nodes, but also monitor others, and they run these uh, very secure, very um, reliable infrastructure systems, and they've been doing it for years. So those are the people kind of securing uh, these reference contracts right now. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you very much, gentlemen. That just about wraps it up for us with our questions. Again, if you have anything else you want to ask, uh, certainly feel free to do so uh, on the various channels. I want to thank uh, Justin and Johan for being here. Um, I know Garth uh, is a behind the scenes guy at, at Synthetics and really helped me put this together. So I certainly want to thank him as well. Um, again, this is the first time we've done this. So as always, we would love your feedback, what you liked, what you didn't like, and how we can definitely improve on this in the future. Uh, but I think exciting stuff with Synthetics, uh, and I can't wait to sort of read about, hear about more as, as this relationship develops. So thank Thank you once again everybody for joining us uh, have a great morning or a great evening wherever you're located at uh, and we look forward to the next time thank you awesome thanks for thank you very thank much you. everyone thank you thank you, thank you. thank you thank you thank you